I'm always a fan of Paul Harvey and Behind the Music and any documentary that kind of shares the, the rest of the story. I always liked that. I always liked uh, the idea on Behind the Music, how it would explain how certain songs that I enjoy were either written or the context for certain lyrics. You know, of course, if you are a fan of Behind the Music, they did relaunch it on Paramount+. Plus. But if you recall, the very first Behind the Music on VH1 was about Millie Vanilli. And who didn't want to know what was going on there with those guys? Now, for all of you who are younger, you can Google it and find out about the great Millie Vanilli and their singing abilities. But nonetheless, we got the reason behind the story, the rest of the story, concerning their lip-syncing scandal and how they were basically hired because of their looks and their dance abilities, not because either of them could sing. There's other times where we get the rest of the story. In fact, as you watch the news, if you spend any time doing that, I think there's a sense nowadays that, that there has to be more to what's going on in what is being reported isn't necessarily everything. So we, we kind of live in this society now, and we have these assumptions that there's more going on than what we see, that there is greater involvement or there are different perspectives or aspects than what we had first thought of when we originally heard or originally saw whatever event we're talking about. There is something going on behind the scenes. And here's what I want to remind you, because of just how Revelation has been interpreted and as such that the focus of most people are on the specific details that are given. So any times that we read any uh, numbers or any, any phrase or any image, oftentimes we want to come up with, well, what are they really talking about? And for so many, they want to find a, a current or a, a modern uh, representation of what was spoken about in Revelation, that somehow today is what it's all about. And even for those that say, well, actually, I believe there's historical events that go along with these details. In fact, when it speaks of the four angels, these four fallen angels or bound angels, it, I don't think it's in any way a coincidence that there were four legions of Romans that ultimately destroyed Jerusalem. So you can find these kind of connections. In fact, there's a lot of individuals who have written a lot of books, made a lot of money in interpreting what all of these mean, trying to give to you exact one-for-one -one ratio when it says something about a lion's face or, or hair like a woman or a face that is feminine or tail like a scorpion. We try to find all of these basically things that are uh, today being represented by those things in the Bible. I just want to tell you that's not what Revelation is about. It's not for us to have a timeline for us to basically determine when Christ is going to return, but rather it reminds us once again of God's consistency, of his accomplishing his purposes using all methods and all means available to him to ultimately do what he's going to do. We see here in Revelation, more importantly, what's going on behind the scenes. And if there's anything that you and I should gain from Revelation, ultimately should be this, that it all begins with prayer that prayer is vitally important and necessary in the life of a believer. That prayer is the discipline, is the means, is the method by which God involves us in his purposes and in his plan. And so this passage, you might think it's all about, you know, different demonic forces that are coming that look a little bit different than the locusts plague of uh, demonic locusts that came earlier that we talked about last week. But the fact is, what is being communicated time and time again in the book of Revelation is the importance of prayer, as well as the priority of worship. But we'll get to that in a little bit. But it all begins with prayer as we begin our passage this morning in chapter 9. It basically, it starts in verse 13, telling us that, that the sixth angel blew his trumpet, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great rivers Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour, the day, the month, the year, were released to kill a third of mankind. 
Now, you might be wondering, well, what is the third of mankind? You might be wondering about these four angels and why they're bound in Euphrates. You might be wondering, well, what does that represent or what do they mean or what do they look like and what are they going to do? That's not what this passage is telling us. And if you're speculating about those things, you're missing what we really are to see. And that is this. Once again, we are presented with the golden altar of incense that was representative of God's people praying to him. If you recall, several weeks ago as we began uh, chapter 8 and then ultimately moved into chapter 9, that, that it really is all about prayer, the prayer of, of God's saints who are underneath that altar, the martyrs back when we looked at the very, you know, the fifth seal. And then there in chapter 8, we heard that there was silence in heaven, that ultimately the prayers of God's people intermingled with the incense, the idea of being interceded for by by Jesus as well as the Holy Spirit that our prayers go up and then ultimately fire comes down from heaven. This is another passage that speaks of our role in God's purposes and plan for the world, and that is prayer. Prayer being the primary, it begins with prayer. And there's some things that we need to, to see from this prayer, and that is that we have our prayers that actually move God to do what he's planned to already do. It's, it's kind of hard, and when people first come to reform theology, it's always difficult for them to, to kind of grasp what it means that God is sovereign. I mean, absolute sovereign over all things. There's not a single molecule in the cosmos that doesn't move according to his plan and according to his will. God has planned the end from the beginning. He has planned all the steps in between, and he did this before the foundation of the world. And so, like the Romans in chapter 9, where they're crying out and saying, well, wait a second, why does God still hold us responsible if he's planned everything? Or why should we pray if God already has planned what he's going to do? And I'll tell you why. Because God said so. I remember saying that as an answer to John Gershner, who, if you don't know who John Gershner is, he was a professor at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary, where R.C. Sproul was a student who studied under John Gershner, as well as my pastor's oldest son, Wynn Kenyon, who were buddies. And so Dr. Gershner was always at our church for conferences and for seminars, and of course, R.C. and Wynn were often there. And when he asked the question, why do we pray? I answered, because God tells us to. Because in my mind, it doesn't make sense. Why pray if God already knows what he's going to do? But there's more to the story. And here is this, that God is sovereign, yet God in his sovereignty has chosen to use the prayers that you pray to ultimately be the motivation and the initiation of the actions that he planned to do from the beginning, from before the foundation of the world. I mean, it's hard to grasp it. And I understand what you were trying to understand is, is the infinite mind of God who in his infinite planning and in his infinite power and his infinite wisdom has said your prayers truly and actually move me to act and to do what I've planned to do. And for us not to pray, for us not to recognize that this is God's approach, we miss out on what God is doing, or we feel that it doesn't matter that he somehow doesn't or isn't concerned with what's going on in our lives. So what we have is that we have this, the, this, um, the altar once again, and ultimately a voice comes from the altar. It doesn't say who the voice is. More than likely it's Jesus or it's God, but he is directing these actions to occur from the altar of incense, the altar basically that is symbolic of God's people praying. So we are praying, and then a voice goes forth from our prayers that ultimately bring into action what God has planned to do from the very beginning. Doesn't make sense. 
but it is reality in terms of our involvement. God has says, I'm going to include you into my purposes. He could have written it in the stars. He could have, he could have done it all without us. He can accomplish all things. He doesn't need any of us, yet he has privileged us with this understanding that it is our prayers that ultimately move God to accomplish his purposes. Purposes that he's already planned, but yet it is the impetus of our prayers that move God. God is sovereign. He has planned the end from the beginning, yet in his sovereignty, he has incorporated your dependence upon him as you cry out to him in prayer, and he responds and he acts according to the requests that we have made, doing what he ultimately had planned from the very beginning. It is a unique connection and networking and interwovenness that I'm baffled by at times, but it is true. And we see it time and time again that we pray because God tells us to pray, but also by praying, God moves and answers our prayers. But yet even the prayers that we pray, that we pray freely and out of desperation or out of fear or out of love or out of concern, God ultimately uses that so that we might see that he is responsive to us, that he does hear our prayers, and that he ultimately acts based upon the requests that we make. And in this passage, the judgment of those who persecuted his people those who put to death all of those under the altar, the entire generation of Israelites who rejected Jesus and ultimately put him to death, when the cries for justice came out as prayers, God ultimately hears that and he responds. And his response is to have these four angels that are bound. At any time you look through Scripture and you see bound angels. They're demons. So once again, we're continuing this, this idea that there are spiritual realities, that there is a spiritual battle going on, that evil does exist, and that it is warring against you, that there are beings that exist whose sole purpose is your destruction, your failure, your insecurity, your despair. They have no other purpose but to ultimately seek to discourage you and in so many ways cause you to doubt or to lose faith. That's for believers. They can't actually do more than that because we have the seal of God upon us, which is the Holy Spirit. Remember I talked about that, how Christians cannot be possessed because you're already possessed by the Holy Spirit. He owns you. You've been bought with a price. He is in you and fills you, and therefore there's no more room. It's like a full cup of water. In fact, that's why Paul speaks of being filled with the Spirit. He wants us to recognize that the Holy Spirit lives within us and that we would be filled with the Spirit so that we are not in any way tempted to be filled with other things, other desires, things that are contrary to the Word of God. But when we come to prayer and God's sovereignty, we are called to pray. And we see in passages like this that our prayers initiate that work or the act of God. However, it's not the primal initiation because that was prepared before the foundation of the world. That's what, that's what the voice basically says. It says, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So that's something that has happened before. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour, the day, the month, the year, were released to kill a third of mankind. So it's in response to the prayers of God's people that God's plan, which he planned for a specific time, hour, and specific reason is now being put into effect. Your prayers have power. The power is, is that you are heard by an all-powerful God who is working all things out according to his plan, but is using your prayers as the means to connect you with his work so that you can be amazed that as you've prayed, your prayers are answered. Sometimes not in the way that you had wanted or asked, but always answered and most often answered better than you could ever ask or imagine. But where we are called to reflect in this passage when we are all concerned about all the details and such, 
We need to recognize that the real call is for you and I to be committed to prayer. Now, there's something else that we see as well in the book of Revelation and even in how God operates and responds to our prayers. People were asking me this past week, they're like, hey, pastor, why now is it speaking of a third of mankind? Everything's in a third. Well, because earlier it was only a quarter. It was only a fourth of the earth of the stars. It was, it was a smaller uh, grouping or a smaller percentage, and now we're at a third. And there's a couple things about numbers that you need to recognize in God's Word. Most numbers, when they are given in Scripture, are not given as a numerical amount. They're not giving us a quantity, per se. They're giving us a literary idea or a concept. So most times, numbers are used that way. Now, there are times where it's used to say, you know, seven means seven, you know, 144 might mean 144. There are those times in which numbers actually mean something. In fact, we have a whole book in the Bible called Numbers. And those numbers are real numbers. It's a census of God's people. But when you come to apocalyptic language and apocalyptic uh, books in the Bible, you'll find that a lot of these numbers just have the idea of giving to us a concept, not necessarily a specific numerical amount. What we're seeing here and what we'll continue to see, because ultimately we're going to see that it goes from a quarter to a third to everybody, is God's incremental judgment. Because God's judgment primarily is for the purpose of leading people to repentance. You need to understand that. That God is gracious in his judgment of unbelievers because of him desiring for them to repent and turn to him. God is incremental in his discipline of us. You see, we're not getting judged. That judgment has occurred, but there is discipline that occurs. We do experience consequences for our sins. It it happens, and you need to recognize that. Just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you won't experience the consequences of your sin. In fact, God desires to protect you from those consequences, and that's why he commands us not to do those things. However, in Christ, there is Therefore, now, no condemnation for those who are in Jesus. So I want you to be clear. Any sin that you have committed or even will commit has been forgiven and has been paid for by Jesus upon the cross. Now, as Paul says, don't, we don't use this freedom, we don't use this knowledge to go on sinning. That's not what it's for. If that's your response, like, oh, if it's all forgiven, I'm just going to do whatever I want. It gets us all the way back to St. Augustine who basically said, all Christians have to do is love God and then do whatever you want. But then he put this caveat in it saying, as a child of God, what is it that you want? And so we are to be motivated and moved by the Spirit of Christ and seek to live our lives in line with what he has taught and how he has lived. So we do have times in which we do sin. You sin, I sin, we all sin. And no matter what that sin is, forgiveness is available. You can repent of that sin, and that sin, its, its condemnation, be removed from you. However, you might experience the consequence of that sin. It doesn't mean that God somehow didn't forgive you or doesn't love you. Here's what I'm saying. If you commit murder and you repent of it, you can be fully and completely forgiven of murder. If we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart concerning the gospel, that if we indeed confess our sins, that God is faithful and just, that he forgives us and cleanses us from all unrighteousness, there is no condemnation for any sin you can repent and be fully and completely forgiven. And that is always the call of the gospel. That's available to you right now that if you have sinned, you can confess your sins knowing that he will fully and completely forgive you. There is no condemnation. Your sin is cast from you as far as the east is from the west. No condemnation. You will not be punished for it. You will not be condemned because of your sin. But there might be consequences. If you commit murder, you might be forgiven of it, but you might spend the rest of your life in jail. And you might even be put to death yourself because of capital punishment. Those are consequences. 
Just because you have no condemnation doesn't mean there is still potentially consequences. So we avoid sin, first and foremost, because we love the Lord. And we desire to live according to what he has taught and the laws and the principles that he has laid down. But we also avoid sin because we don't want to experience the consequences that occur when we perform these actions, even though the sin itself is forgiven. God is doing this and does this throughout scriptures, where he begins slowly in his judgment, giving smaller chastisement, causing smaller difficulties that over time they continue to increase. So here we have, in particular, in the book of Revelation, the rebellion of the Jewish people who rejected Jesus and how that continued to expand to incorporate all types of behaviors that God's judgment began to grow and increase. So it's incremental. A third does it actually is a number. Not necessarily, but it's saying that it's increasing. But look at it. It's not 50% and it's not the majority but yet it is a significant number of individuals that are now being put to death because of their sin, because of the actions of, of God that has begun because of our prayers. So, the other thing that we are reminded of is what we talked about last week, and that is the spiritual source of human actions. That there is a spiritual reality. There is something behind the story, behind the events that is of this demonic nature that, that God has released these four angels. And like I said, there could be the physical representation of them, which is the four legions that ultimately did ransack Jerusalem. But the idea is that these human individuals, these, these human actions are the result of demonic movement. All right, of, of the locusts that, that ultimately we saw last week. And by the way, as you go through Scripture, you'll see all kinds of um, times in which um, invading armies are listed as and, and referred to as locusts. From all of the book of Joel, you read Joel, it's all about foreign armies, enemies as locusts. Uh, Judges 6 uh, and 5 and 7, I'll speak of that. Jeremiah 51, Nahum 3. If you read through it, you'll see that, that it's speaking of these human forces that are being compelled or being directed basically by these demonic forces. So you have these human actors that are being directed by demonic forces. And as I said last week, yes, those who are outside of Christ, those without the seal of God upon them, those who are not in Christ, those who do not have the Holy Spirit living within them can be and are children of the devil. And that's why Paul and why I follow his advice in terms of making sure, even what Jesus says concerning being equally yoked, that as a believer... Your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your spouse, before you marry them, you should make sure that they are in Christ because you are becoming one with an individual who's under the authority of the prince of the power of the air of Satan himself. Why would you unite yourself together with that? Well, he's cute, I understand, and she's adorable and just completes you. But if she or he is not a believer... You're setting yourself up for failure because these satanic, these demonic forces do use human actors in what they do. And those outside of Christ are ultimately theirs to be used by Satan, by demons. Now, I'm not one to believe that there's a demon behind every bush or tree or chair, but guess what? There could be. And if we are unaware of this spiritual reality, then we're not going to be ready for the fight. In fact, even Paul speaks to the fact that, that our weapons are not of, of this world. They're not, they're not the same approach that, that the world uses to accomplish their purposes. But rather, we see more and more that prayer is the primary means and method by which God acts, God responds, God moves when his people pray. And so when you see things in your life that aren't where you think they need to be, should be, or would like them to be, my question is, are you praying? 
You see, we've gotten caught up in believing that it all comes down to our actions or what we're going to do or the plan that we have in place or how we budget or how we manage our time or how we are able to win friends and influence people. We take these approaches, and now today in our society, we find that individuals who are fully committed to Christ are trying to use the methods of this world to enact change. They're going to rally. They're going to petition. They're going to you got a voter drive and going to make sure that they're politicians in charge because that'll be the answer. And it's not. It's not at all. The weapons of our warfare primarily is prayer, submission to God, to seek his kingdom and his righteousness. So when we, we look at these things, I want you to recognize that, that, yes, there is a reality of spiritual warfare going on in our lives. And more than that, we need to recognize that, that there are things that occur in this world, occur in this life, that sometimes are done by us, that result in difficulties, sometimes are done to us, or just because we live in a broken, fallen world. Here's what I'm saying. There's things in your life right now that are not going right, that aren't where they need to be. Your relationship with Christ might not be where you want it to be. There's, there's sin that might be besetting in your life that you're constantly battling with and struggling with. So sometimes difficulties arise. God uses consequences to ultimately lead us to repentance, as I was saying. Do you recognize that when you commit sin and there's consequences to that, God is incrementally calling you to repentance? It might be because of something that you have done. And if you've done something, then you need to examine yourself. In fact, in a few moments when we partake of the supper, you'll have a time to examine your heart and and you can kind of see, well, what's going on and what have I done that has led to some of the difficulties that I'm facing, the the feelings of separation that I have from my Heavenly Father right now, the disconnection I have with family members or friends. It might be because of something that you've done. And you can repent of that and receive full and complete forgiveness. But secondly, you could be experiencing difficulty in your life right now because of the actions that someone else has done. And because of what they've done, it has impacted you and hurt you and caused you difficulty and caused you pain. And those are times where we can cry out to God and and say that it seems that this is happening because of what someone else has done. And it might be your opportunity to go to that individual and begin a Matthew 18 process in which if you're offended, you can go and say, I've been offended. And you can seek to restore and be reconciled with your brother or sister. So sometimes terrible things are going on in your life, difficulties you're facing in your day-to-day activities or in your relationships is because of, the reason is because of what somebody else has done. And then finally, You might be experiencing difficulty and pain and and problems and, and despair and concern just because we live in a broken, fallen world where disease exists, where 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 death occurs, where destruction happens. And so even as I I look at my own life and and as I recognize, okay, there's there's suffering that's occurring in my life because you know disease exists. There, there, is, there are times in my life where other people's actions or words have, have hurt me. And then, more often than not, it's just me doing stupid stuff. And you too. But God ultimately is using these difficulties, these, these circumstances and these situations to bring about your repentance. And even as God, in, in this passage that we're looking at, I mean, in the end, there is a time when final judgment will come. In fact, that's part of my job is to prepare you for that. That there will be a time where the final judgment occurs and you have no other opportunity to repent or to turn from it. That time will come for all of us. We don't know when it will be. But when it happens, I hope that you're prepared, that you're ready to stand before God to be able to, to express that you are trusting in Christ alone for your salvation that it's not based upon your efforts or your works or your abilities, but rather based purely upon what Christ has done for you. His death upon the cross, paying in full the penalty for your sin. His righteousness, his perfect righteousness imputed to you as being the basis for your justification, for being made right in the presence of God. But even leading up to that, there are those times where the consequences are calling you to faith 
and repentance, calling you back to saying, well, what should I be truly knowing and doing and being? So one of the things that's kind of interesting about, uh, about these, these human entities that are being driven by spiritual forces, and I just want to go back to, to the spiritual sources. This is how you need to understand Revelation. I'm going to, I'm going to share with you. Whenever you read something, you might say, well, wait a second. What is this referring to? And I don't want you to try to find some current or modern equivalent, but rather, as always, go back and see what God's Word says. So here in chapter 9, when it's speaking of, of these, these evil forces that, that are going out, that, that are, are basically the huge numbers. So verse 16, the number of mounted troops was twice 10,000 times 10,000. I heard their number. All right? I heard their number. So, John hears the number, and what he's basically saying is, if you know, you know. Oh, I heard that number. I heard that phrase. There are phrases that individuals will say, and then you can also recognize maybe, oh, by what you said, you must have served in the military. And you, and you veterans, you know that. There's, there's phrases that, that people use or, or statements that are made that you say, ah, that person served in the military. Same with any profession almost as pastors. I know when people use certain phrases like, oh, you must be in, in ministry, probably full-time ministry. If you're an electrician, there's certain phrases and certain, I heard the number. So John is even pausing here and saying, now before you lose hope and think, oh no, oh no, there's these demonic forces, these, these locusts that are let loose, these four bound angels that are now uh, unbound and, and they're coming forward to kill a third of mankind on the land. Wait, who's in control here? But John says, wait a second. Oh, I hear their number. And it reminds him and should remind everyone who has a strong familiarity with the Old Testament of Psalm 68, where it speaks of the number of God's army. The chariots of God are twice 10,000, thousands upon thousands. The Lord is among us. Sinai is now in the sanctuary. And if you read through the rest of Psalm 68, you'll see that it is God enacting judgment upon the enemies of Israel. The issue is, is that Israel has now become the enemy. In fact, the, the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls, remember, they're all basically repeats of the plagues of Egypt, where God is basically saying, if you're going to act like Egypt, you're going to be treated like Egypt. So I want you to recognize that, that even though I speak of the spiritual powers and authority, it's still all under God. It's still his authority and his power that does it. It's his armies. The demons and the devil, they're God's demons and devils. They only do what he commands them to do. Has he given them authority and power? Yes, but it is authority and power with limits that he himself has created, all for the purpose of leading us to repentance. The other thing that we need to recognize is that as we view all that is going on, as we recognize all that God is doing, and even in using demonic forces to bring about his will as he responds to our prayers, you and I need to realize and remember that God is working all things together for good. That God is good, and as such, all things work together for good. Does that mean all things are good? Meaning in and of themselves? No, but God works them together for good. And so God is going to use consequences in your life. He's going to use uh, spiritual forces. He's going to use physical people and events and circumstances all for good in the lives of those who are called according to his purpose. So regardless of what you're going through and the source of what you're going through, you can believe the promise that God will work it for good. It doesn't mean that while you're experiencing, it's good. You know, things that I'm personally experiencing in my life and in my family's life are not good. But I do believe that God will work it for good. I do believe that even though there are demonic forces and there's disease and there's death, that God ultimately is control. Any army is God's army. Any plan is actually God's plan. The prayers we pray are actually praying for God to put into place plans he's already made. God's in control, and he's sovereign. Now, as we're seeing God's judgment come, 
upon the nation of Israel and ultimately the pattern of his judgment to come upon all mankind, what is the reason for this judgment to come? This is important. And that is the primary thing is what they didn't repent of is their false worship. The worshiping of demons, the created things, the power, sex, money, power, you know, these worldly things that people pursue, as well as worshiping idols, gold and silver. Now, granted, I don't think any of us have little statues in our house that we're, we're praying to and worshiping, but we do worship our reputation. We do desire money. We desire power. We desire privilege. We pursue these things, oftentimes to the extent where we're excluding all kingdom work because we're more worried about building our own kingdom than we are building the kingdom of God. And yet, it is the primary sin listed here. I mean, there's murder, of course. There's, there's theft. There's sexual immorality. But the biggest thing, the first thing that God speaks of is false worship. Not worshiping, first and foremost, Jesus as the Son of God. As God in the flesh, God of li- God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made. Recognizing who he is, failure to recognize and worship Jesus for who he is will be the primary judgment that will be upon all people, where you stand in relationship with Jesus. Murder, theft, sexual immorality, all the other sins are secondary to where do you stand in relationship with Jesus. And to worship falsely or incorrectly or to deny who Jesus is is by far the greatest sin you can commit. And it's exactly what first century Israel did. They rejected Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of God, as the one who was sent for their redemption, the promised one who was to fulfill the covenant on their behalf. They rejected him. So let me tell you, where you worship, how you worship, who you worship, should be a priority. You should go to a church that isn't about worshiping in the way that you appreciate or enjoy or like or is convenient, but you should worship in a church that seeks to be true to what the Bible declares to be worship with the focus of that worship being Jesus and God's glory. I think you found that at Pinewood. And as I interact with other churches in the community and other pastors, I recognize there's a lot of good churches out there. And we are united with those churches. And we rejoice when they rejoice and we mourn when they mourn because they are indeed our brothers and sisters. But there are also some churches out there that I wonder, how are they in terms of operating in line with God's word? And it seems like they operate more along the principles of this world and of corporations and of businesses. And what they speak is also uh, communicating not the gospel of Jesus, our ongoing dependence and need for him, but rather ways in which you can minimize the law of God but still believe you're making it. Do you, do you realize that? I've been thinking about that recently, that, you know, the statements that Jesus makes, you know, if there is sin in your life, if your eye causes you to sin, your hand, what does he say? Gouge it out, cut it off. He tells us if we're compelled to go one mile to go two. He tells us if we get slapped on the, the, the one cheek, we turn the other cheek. And more than that, we should be praying for our enemies. That one's in particular. We should be praying for our enemies. I don't know how many enemies you have, and I don't know if any of us would say we really have enemies. But in this context, it's probably not good that you don't have enemies. It means you're probably not living out your faith because when we live out our faith in this world, you're going to make enemies. Now, I'm not saying be rude, be confrontational. I'm just saying, Christians, as we live out our faith, we recognize that this world is going to persecute us. So if you don't have enemies in terms of spiritual enemies, then maybe you're not really living out your faith that They're not concerned about you because you're really not doing anything. So I encourage you, yes, 
to, to live out your faith. I encourage you to be engaged in living our lives for God's glory and living according to his laws in their fullness. But what happens is, is that they minimize it. So, you know, maybe you're not turning the other cheek, but you're, you know, you're trying really hard. You're going to do these three steps. And maybe you're not living and uh, for your spouse as Christ loves the church and loving her that way, but we'll give you four or five steps that you can do. It seems that they minimize the law of God with easy, tidbit, self-help kind of principles to help you feel like you're actually doing what God requires when those of us who actually look at what God requires know that I need Jesus, that you need Jesus. I never go to God's law and say, oh, I got that one. That's good. Check. Check. Yeah, check. No. It's what a wretched individual I am. Who will deliver me from this body of sin and death? Thanks be to Jesus. So with all of this and the idea of worshiping according to God's word and knowing who Jesus is and the fact that God uses our prayers to accomplish what he's already planned, even though we don't know what those plans are, we're just praying out and crying out, what does that tell us? What do we really get from this passage? And this is it. Bold, submissive prayer. I'm convicted and realize that we as a church need more prayer. In fact, I want to encourage you to come on out for our prayer intercessors. I encourage you to sign up for our prayer list. I encourage you to spend time in prayer. You're going to realize that it is the means and method by which God's will is accomplished as God uses our prayers, responds to them, and acts out that which he's already planned. Bold, submissive prayer. What does that mean? Well, the submissive part I think we understand. That is ultimately we know God knows best. And as such, we can hear Jesus even praying that the whole plan of salvation, his dying upon the cross, Jesus asked last minute, hey, can we, can we switch this up a little bit? Can, can we try something else? Father, if there's any way for this cup to pass, let it be. However, what did he always say? Not my will, but yours be done. So there has to be that submissive understanding that God ultimately is going to answer and do and act according to what he has planned. But we also know, as James tells us, you have not because you ask not, which means that if you ask, you'll receive, which is exactly what Jesus says. We should be bold. We should not be hesitant. We should be bold in what we ask for. In fact, I believe that's why Jesus so often encourages us to be childlike in our faith and in our understanding. A couple weeks back when my brother and sister-in-law were out of town. I had the opportunity to, to pick up uh, my two oldest uh, nephew and niece at school. I did it all week. And we had a great time. It was a lot of fun. And, and I always love the fact that, that they think so highly of me. I mean, they think I have powers to do all types of things. One time they asked me if uh, they could have ribs, ribs for dinner. Can we, hey, Unc, can you make ribs? They call me Unc. Can you, can you make ribs? I'm like, well, dinner's in like two hours, and it takes six hours to do ribs. It's going to take a while to smoke them. And, you know, Jackson was just like, well, do it faster. I mean, <laughs> you can do that. You have the power to do ribs in less than six hours. And then we were talking about Disney World and, and uh, just uh, that kind of stuff. And they said, hey, Unc, why don't you just rent out Disney World? Because apparently they went to Disney World as something that my brother, where they rented out the whole place, the company uh, that he's with. They rented out the place. They thought that was awesome. So they're like, Unc, you should do that. I'm like, I'll get right on that. But I love it. I love it. They, they expect that I can do these amazing things, that I'm able to, you know, cook food instantaneously, that I'm able to rent out the entire Disney World theme park. And there's other things where they just expect me to have incredible strength, incredible amounts of money, incredible good looks. Well, they're good with that. That's okay. They're good looks for them. <laughs> but they're also kids. They know they, they don't have power to do anything. So they do submit. But man, even though they submit, they ask with boldness. And I think that we've become timid. Or we don't fully understand prayer. Or we're not realizing, but this passage reminds us, that God moves when we pray. That he accomplishes what he's planned to accomplish, but yet it's our prayers that ultimately move him. So that you and I can see what he's done and said, wow, wow. You're truly at work in this. You're truly in charge, and you're truly God.
So, after we've read this passage and we see how God operates and we understand that he incorporates us and uses us, what are you lacking in your life? What is wrong in your life? What difficulties are, are you facing? What problems are you dealing with? Why didn't you ask? Or why aren't you asking? And if you haven't been asking, then it's time to ask. If you are asking and haven't heard a response, keep asking. But know that in the end, when it is answered, it's going to be better than what you could have ever planned, imagined, or prayed. Because God is sovereign, and he's accomplishing his purposes. Sometimes in terms of cataclysmic judgment upon a nation, but also just in every day, conforming you more and more into the image of Jesus. Remember that. God isn't concerned about your comfort primarily. That's not his, that's not his priority, your comfort. His priority is your conformity into the image of his son, our Savior, Jesus. So if you have not, why aren't you asking? If you're lacking, why aren't you asking? If you're suffering, why aren't you asking? Prayer, and prayer alone, is the primary means that God uses to interact with us for us to see his purposes and ultimately to be blessed by him.